so there's a variety of different approaches the states are taking to protect wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, some are taking their own permitting programs, two have taken over the federal program. Um, there's a range of, I would imagine, voluntary or economic incentive programs to protect wetlands. Um, what have you seen uh, among the states, uh, again, there's probably no consensus, but what seem to be uh, most effective tools the states are finding for protecting wetlands? Uh, and has it changed over time? Mm -hmm. Has it been permitting at one point and economic incentives at other points? Or um, what do you see in the states in that area? That's just a, a an interesting area where I think things are really changing. I mean, one tool that's really effective is public education. You know, raising the awareness amongst the general population about the role of wetlands in the ecology. And I think some of the severe storms that we've seen recently, Hurricane Katrina, which in part the flooding was attributed to the breakdown of the natural barrier provided by the wetlands. Mm -hmm. We saw that also with Hurricane Sandy up in the Northeast only a few years ago. Um, and just flooding in general, I think that public education is becoming a real component of, of states helping people understand why wetlands matter. They're also, of course, habitat. So they're very important to the, the, the whole ecosystem in terms of the, the you know, insect population, the plant population. Um, so the value of wetlands as a public protection in terms of storm surge, and um, natural filtration of storm and wastewater. It's all really coming to light. So I definitely think states are spending more time informing the public about the, the working wetlands in our country and the services that they provide, the environmental services. Um, now, now when you talk about public education, do you mean just simply things like um, information campaigns through websites and the media yeah. or even possibly working in the schools with some sort of a development of curriculum to provide that information or, or all of the above? I think it's really all of the above. I think states are taking pretty broad approaches to educating but also working with industry sectors to talk about, um, you know, for example, home builders or um, the energy production industry that we have um, wide exponential growth in, in energy in our country right now in terms of the infrastructure siting, pipelines going through wetlands, we have transmission lines that are being sited through wetlands. It's really working with industry groups to see if we can reduce the adverse impact on wetlands as we develop because development is not stopping. Right. Um, that's one thing. Um, I talked with one state who's spending a lot of time uh, focusing on, on linear projects, which are like these highway projects, transmission line projects, and really working with the industry sectors that are responsible, including state agencies, to state departments of transportation, to talk about the effect of linear projects that cover and go through large areas. And, and thinking about how upfront, how do you think about the implications of wetlands and protecting and mitigating your, your adverse taking essentially of these wetlands as you go through. Um, living shorelines is an area that, that I've heard states now talking about. Um, helping people understand um, that um, you can build a, a concrete barrier, which is not particularly attractive, or the green infrastructure movement, which has become very big in our country and in a lot of urban areas, making urban areas more attractive to be in. You could have a concrete barrier that pro provides flood protection or you could have a natural barrier that provides some, some flood protection. And really getting community groups to accept what might look like weeds to some people, but actually is a natural system that could provide the same protection as, as a, a concrete wall. So, you know, I think that, I mean, your question was really about what are states doing that, that are innovative, and, and I, I am probably focusing more on public education than because I don't know how many other tools there are in the toolbox for states. Right. Um, I really do think that uh, aside from, at, we know there's been some movement towards mitigation banks. They haven't quite taken off nationally the way I think some people thought they would, but they do exist, uh, but they're not the panacea. Uh, reducing the need to mitigate is, is important. Project planning 
upfront project planning is important. And I really think uh, the states being playing that more active role through the authorities they have, like the 401 certifications, maximizing those and not just being an afterthought, but being integral to a project. And even though the permitting is being done by the Army Corps in most cases, um, making sure the state's not sitting by the sidelines. Because it really is their resource that, that, uh, that matters to them. I mean, most state regulators that I've worked with feel pretty passionately about protecting the natural resources that they have in the state. And they recognize there is that balance with growth and, and new facilities being cited. But the, the tourism value of beautiful wetlands and the space, the um, birding, the habitat, um, the recreational opportunities that there are in some of the streams and tributaries that are surrounded by wetlands are incredible. And, they're, and, and one thing that governors get is tourism revenue. Right. And so right. to the extent that we can connect a, a, a value in wetlands to economic and tourism dollars in that state, we, we huh. might have the magic solution. So again, like so many other areas in the environment these days, uh, it clearly is not command and control. It's tying it to a recognition of the economic benefits and, and what the resources provide to the public and, exactly. and the folks in the state. Mm -hmm. and, so, yeah. and there are a lot of new partners that states are working with, like the Nature Conservancy, to protect what are called healthy watersheds. Mm -hmm. And that's really a, a movement that I've seen in just my years of being an environmental practitioner. And you know, in the early days of environmental law, we were really dealing with everything was contaminated and everything was polluted. And it was just about trying to get um, streams just out of the tank, essentially, because they were in such bad condition. Now, there are still streams in, in poor condition that are impaired, but we're also now focusing on what are called healthy watersheds. A lot of states are really starting to develop very robust and thoughtful protection-oriented programs, and wetlands are a part of that, because they're now turning and saying, sort of like um, in the medical field, if you can prevent someone from getting sick, sometimes it's less expensive than treating them once they are ill. And it's the same thing with the environment. If we can keep some of these water bodies healthy now by preserving the wetlands and even creating um, areas that were through zoning and local land use are protected, we may then ultimately solve a variety of environmental problems or prevent a variety of problems later.